Not today. Uh, I'm going to preach another passage, but I just thought that would be a good preview of coming attractions. Since we're going to be looking at the Apostle Paul, we might as well hear from Paul himself about what he thought about his ministry. That's going to set the table for us. That was well worth the time. So before we dig into the text that we are going to look at this morning, would you join me as I pray for you, first and foremost, and then myself? Join me as I pray. Heavenly Father, I pray now that this will be a unique and very significant, not only opportunity for service, but the reality of very significant service that takes place as we examine your word and have the integrity to listen to it, to be led by the Spirit of God, to think of our lives as we know ourselves and compare ourselves with the eternal word of God. Lord, I pray that no man or no woman here who hears your word this morning would dare shuck or shun even the slightest bit of instruction, reproof, correction, or training for righteousness. But Father, give us a spirit that hungers and thirsts to know Your Word so that we can be revealed in the mirror of Your Word, exposed for exactly who we are. And Father, desire with all of our hearts to take care of matters that need to be attended to for Your glory and for Your honor. And Father, for our serviceability to You so that we can advance Your kingdom in a way that we are not now prepared to do so. Father, I pray that you would make a change in the lives of every one of us. Father, as I am well reminded that I am preaching to myself first and foremost, Father, I pray that you would make a change in me and that you would use me in the lives of these seated before me. Lord, may you be glorified and may you be honored and may your people, your followers, your loved ones be more desirous to serve you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The world has yet to see what God can do through a man whose life is fully committed to him. Those are the words of a saint of another century by the name of Henry Varley. Two things I'd like to say about that quote. His aspiration is phenomenal. He went on to say, but by God's grace, I shall be that man. Boy, isn't that excellent? That's what I'm hoping, that's what I'm trusting, that's what I've been praying for will be the reality in the hearts of every one of you. That you will aspire to be that kind of saint of God. But Henry Varley was wrong in his assertion. The world has already seen what God can do through a man whose heart is completely devoted to him. I don't know how Varley missed that. It is the Apostle Paul. What more could you ask for? I cannot imagine another servant of God who was more sold out in his love and devotion and daily commitment to Jesus Christ than the Apostle Paul. And can we, can we not help but to see what God did through that man? how He touched the lives of literally millions to this present day through His example, chronicled for us in the book of Acts, and His many letters that He has written that continue to be used by God in the lives of believers every day. No. 
The Apostle Paul was one that we can look to as an example for us to follow. We have to be careful in who and what we're following. But I want to assert to you that in the Apostle Paul, as we're going to see through Scripture this morning, he is a safe one to follow. There was a man who was strolling through a cemetery, and one day he saw a headstone. He paused and read that headstone, which read Epitaph. And the epitaph read as follows. Pause, stranger, when you pass me by. For as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you shall be. Prepare yourself to follow me. The man thought about it. And he thought some more. He took out a pen. Took out a sticky note and he began to scribble on that note. And he wrote, epilogue. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. sage counsel for a man receiving advice to follow. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I am giving you this morning biblical counsel to follow. You can trust it. The issue is, what are you going to do with it? At the end of the message today, what is going to be your commitment? Let me use the word for the very first time. How will you be resolved? Now we're going to look at the Apostle Paul, and I want to take you to our passage of Scripture. Find your way to 2 Timothy chapter 4. That is the text that I'm going to be preaching from this morning. We're going to be looking at the life of the Apostle Paul. We're going to be looking at what is known as his very last words. And they are the last words that we have from the Apostle Paul that have been incorporated into the canon of Scripture. And... Uh, To set this in context, let me just deal with a few verses that are just previous to the preaching text. 2 Timothy chapter 4, that's where I want you to be. But uh, look at verse 5. Let's set the context here. Notice what Paul writes to Timothy, beginning in verse 5. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship... Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Now notice this. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. And then from there, we're going to pick up our preaching text. The context is simply that. Paul's life was all but over. He knew it. He was waiting for his execution. He had completed his course. He had fought the fight and he'd fought well. He had kept the faith. In reality, Paul was still going to be ministering to millions of believers through the words that he would write that would finish out this letter. Now, as you, we contemplate his last words, it, it seems like, boy, these are just a lot of loose ends. Just uh, uh, various and sundry bits and pieces of data and information. But brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, a careful study of uh, these various subject matters gives to us very important truths. And they reveal to us a spiritual cardiogram of the heart of the Apostle Paul. I'm telling you, this man was so worthy of a servant that he cannot even wrap up various bits and pieces unless it's in the way of profound, significant truth that is a worthy guide for believers of all ages to follow for their own life. And that's what we have with these final bits and pieces, the final words of the Apostle Paul. In a word... 
we're going to be talking about serving the Lord. Service unto God. More specifically, we're going to be talking about serving the Lord with excellence. Now, I've been around the block a couple of times, and I'm well advised enough to know that in a congregation of God's people, there are some that say, yeah, service, that's biblical. I know it is. I don't have a problem with it. I know that it's there, and it's for our instruction, and it's the Word of God, and uh, I know we're supposed to be, but, you know, the truth is I'm just not. And I want to say that's not okay, but I have been there. It's part of my testimony. I, I was saved, baptized, and for a while doing absolutely nothing. I wasn't proud of that. But I know where you're coming from. Afraid to serve, don't think you can serve, not geared to serve, just it's just kind of out of reach, it's just kind of not your thing. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to tell you, you were saved to serve. There are some things that we've got to take care of before we even examine our passage of Scripture. Do you, and this is an opportunity for me to get off, I've I've got to be careful here, but do you realize that as you are saved, that you are going to stand before Jesus Christ in judgment? Do you realize that? Judgment. You say, wait a minute, I thought that's what I was saved from. No, I'm not talking about a judgment of sin. I'm talking about when you stand before Jesus Christ, you are going to give an account of your life. And your life is going to be reviewed by Jesus Christ. And you are going to be judged according not to your sin, but how you have served Him once you came to faith in Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, there is nothing more significant that I or anybody could talk to you about, remind you of, show you guidance from Scripture in how you can begin to serve or upgrade your service as it now is. Let me just give you a little bit of insight here uh, to, to kind of get us launched into our study this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, don't turn there, stay in 2 Corinthians. Timothy, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading. Listen carefully how Paul is going to pivot here. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and now notice this, and prefer rather to be absent from the body to be home with the Lord. We can say amen to that, right? Boy, that's our heart's desire. We got it. We understand that. We're in the body. We're on earth. We're right here. We're not at home, our forever home with the Lord. We'd prefer to be there, but right now we're here. We are saved, but we are left here. Here. Now, notice what Paul says. Therefore, since we want to be there, but we are here, we are saved, but yet we're saved and we're still here. Therefore, also we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing with the Lord. Our ambition is not just to no longer be here, but to be there. That is our ambition. It should be our ambition. But listen to Paul. He's not saying, but that's the only ambition we have. He says, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. For, this is what is called an explanatory guard. It's going to explain that other ambition that we have. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Do you understand that, child of God? You're saved from your sin, but you're going to be judged by Christ according to how you have served Him and what needs to be throbbing in your heart every day of your life. 
is to seize the opportunity to be pleasing to Him. Pleasing when you are there. Pleasing while you are here. Because to the degree that you are pleasing to Him right now, right here, you will be pleasing to Him there and then on that day when you stand before Him. There is no separating the two. They are tied together for time and for eternity. It is absolutely significant that we take our role of serving every day in any and every way as seriously as our salvation. Let me just remind you of one other passage of Scripture. Jesus Christ said, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, is the text, don't turn there. But Jesus was talking about being a servant as he was a servant. And he said, he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. I was not a double agenda. That was just the the epitome of his service was to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the ultimate act of service that he would provide in a context of ongoing and unfaltering service to mankind. He is our Lord and Savior. And we are Christians. We are Christ ones. We are Christ followers. And men and women of God, if that means anything at all, then that means for you and it means for me that we, like Him, must be about the business of serving, advancing the kingdom of Jesus Christ every day, in every way possible. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, I've already said it once, but let me make it clear so that you don't think that I'm speaking beyond you to somebody else. My purpose in preaching this passage of Scripture is for every one of us either to become or enhance our role of serving the Lord and to serve Him with excellence. Serve Him with excellence. Let me just ask you, with God's design for this passage of Scripture, first of all to Timothy and then to us, after the model of the Apostle Paul himself, are you serving the Lord with excellence? Right now in your life, with the opportunities of your life as you know it, intended by God, superintended by God, authored by God, Are you serving Him with excellence? Are you serving the Lord at all? Some of you say, I'm guilty at that point. i got to get started. Friend, I hope you'll get started. If you're not serving the Lord with excellence, you're serving Him, but it's kind of, sort of service. I pray it'll go from kind of, sort of serving to serving with excellence. And we have a text that's going to help us in doing that. We're going to see three resolves required for all who would serve the Lord with excellence. Now, my notes are your notes. You have them, just about all of them. And so hopefully that will be an aid to follow me through the Scripture. But we see what these resolves are. Could I just say this about the resolves? In our text, we're going to be quickly expounding together this morning. Paul is not formatting for us three resolves. This is just the overflow of his life as he's writing out these final specifics of instruction. But for us, at least for me, if not for you, I am so different from the Apostle Paul, I can't even stay in his shadow. What was just overflowing from his life, I look at that and make sense of that and say, man, I know nothing about that. I know very little about that. I'm going to have to resolve that what what was true of Paul can become true of me. That's where I am. And you know what? I'm not your judge and I'm not qualified to be your judge. But I can't help but think that's probably the case with you as well. So that's why I've formatted our study here. Three resolves. Because what I'm going to learn from the Apostle Paul, I'm going to have to make a resolve. So that can be true of me. And maybe that's exactly how it is for you as well. So if I can just presume upon that, we're going to see three resolves that are required for everyone 
who had served the Lord with excellence. Now, if I can just say, I don't know about you, but I'm jazzed about this. I want to learn, and not just learn, but really learn, be able to do what I learn. And I hope that's going to be the net effect for you. How will you be resolved at the end of this message to serve the Lord differently? Whether it's just beginning or continuing, but continuing at a far higher level. How will you be resolved? Let's look first of all at this first resolve. Having experienced profound deprivation, I will remain committed to advance God's kingdom. Boy, I'm going to have to really fly, but I hope I won't be so fast that you miss Paul's profound deprivation. Let's look first of all at his deprivation and then at the kingdom advance as we begin our study here. 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 9 as we get started. Make every effort to come to me soon. Boy, Paul in his, in his Mamertine Roman imprisonment, uh, Marty, did you have the opportunity when you went to see that dungeon? You did? Uh, I did too, the second time. It was closed the first time. Who can close a prison? A dungeon. But we went to Italy and it was, it was closed for some kind of repair or something. We had to go back another time. And not, that was my wife's, and I, didn't ha- I wasn't guilty of that. But going back the second time, I wanted to see it, and it was finally open. Just a hole in the ground, totally rocks. That's all it is. It's a dungeon. That's where Paul was. And he's there in that dungeon. And uh, we're seeing his profound deprivation. How was Paul de- deprived? He was deprived specifically of Timothy. I mean, Timothy, when, when he writes his first epistle to Timothy, he says about him in chapter 1, verse 2, my true child of the faith. And in Philippians, uh, Philippians, this is just staggering uh, that Paul would write this. But listen to what Paul writes to the Philippian church about old Timothy here. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 19, he says, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Now listen to this. For I have no one else. With all of Paul's co-workers, he can say, For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven work that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. What an accolade! What a reality! What a precious commodity was Timothy to the Apostle Paul. But right now, he's in Rome. He's in this dungeon. Timothy is in Ephesus. Paul knows that the sands are quickly running out of the hourglass of his life. And he is wanting with all of his heart's desire to see Timothy before he leaves planet earth. Here's a man, here's this great servant of God who is suffering, if you will, profound deprivation. His heart aches to see Timothy, but he's in Ephesus. And then he goes on, he says, here's another reason why he is so longing to see Timothy. This speaks to his deprivation even more fully. Look at verse 10. For Demas... Having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Now stop right there. There's nothing new under the sun. Here's a man by the name of Demas. He was a co-worker with the Apostle Paul. You can find him at the end of, uh, of the book of Colossians and at the end of the book of Philemon. He, he, is, he is noted as a co-laborer with Paul. And he was a co-laborer for years. But what happened to Demas? Tragically, look at it again, verse 10. Uh, verse 10. For Demas, having loved this present world. 
having loved this present world, he has deserted me. He has deserted me. Now, it's true he had deserted the Lord, but notice Paul's pain here, his personal deprivation. Paul says, he has deserted me. Paul took that personally because it was so painful because of what had happened. What had happened? Tragically, he writes, Demas, having fallen in love with the world. This was a process. It was so minute. It took Paul by surprise. Child of God, mark that. That could happen to you. That could happen to me. That could happen to any Christ follower. A slow, like termites, eating away at your resolve, your commitment, your faithfulness in following Christ. It happened to Demas. And he deserted Paul, having Fallen in love with the things of the world. There's so much good teaching there, but I don't have time to go there. Mark it carefully. There are many, are they not, that look like they're going to be fruitful. And we see evidence perhaps of their fruitfulness. But time tells on them. And they're, they're either rocky soil. When difficulty comes out and persecution comes, they're nowhere to be found. They're out of here. They abandon Christ. They abandon the ministry. They abandon biblical truth. Then there's those who are the thorny soil. And the cares and the anxieties and the things of the world creep in and cause them to be unfruitful. We don't know which was true for Demas, but one of them was. He was no longer with the Apostle Paul. Oh, Paul's profound deprivation. But then notice this, verse 10 again. Now, these are men of a different stripe and a different reality. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Now, these people weren't defecting. They weren't deserting Paul. But this is part of his profound deprivation as he's in that dungeon. He is sending Crescens out to ministry. He is sending Titus out to ministry. They are free and they can go. That They can live and speak and serve in the gospel. Paul can't do that. He's stuck in that dungeon. And these are faithful servants and he's sending them out as ambassadors of the gospel, the very thing he can no longer be, the very thing he can no longer do. And as great as that was for Crescens, as great as that was for Titus, how that must have bit at the heart of the Apostle Paul that what is true for them will no longer ever again never be true for me. Profound deprivation. And yet, one more layer we can see of this deprivation. Only Luke is with me. No, wait a minute, I've got to say something about that. Boy, that sounds like a slight on Luke, right? Oh, it's so bad, and I'm stuck with Luke. Luke's here with me. He's all I got. Boy, now we're talking the bottom of the barrel. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's just saying all of his co-workers are out there serving Christ and the gospel. Only Luke is with me. That's why I see, man, my barrel is empty. Luke is with me. Where I am, he's always been. A few times we get separated, but he quickly follows. He's like my thumbprint. I, I just can't be rid of him. I don't want to be rid of Dr. Luke. Man, Paul, his ministry was helped out by Luke tremendously. How in the world could that man and all that he had to endure in persecution survive without Dr. Luke? No, that's not a slight on Luke. Let's read on. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful for me to serve us. We'll come back to that. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. Now... It's that last verse, verse 13, that I want you to look at. Notice his profound deprivation. All in the world that Paul had, 
of significance he did not have with him in that dungeon. And what are the things that he most wanted? The barest of all essentials. He wanted a cloak. The winter was coming. And boy, he needed that cloak. And he needed it coming his way now. And he needed the books and the parchments. The books were understood to be the Old Testament scrolls. That's what Paul wanted in that dungeon, was the Word of God as it was compiled at that time. And then the parchments were these expensive animal skins, probably for the Apostle Paul to write more and further letters. This was the writing for documentation. And so Paul wanted the Scripture. He wanted the cloak. He wanted these these expensive sheet documents so he could perhaps write more of Scripture. The basic essentials. That's what Paul was craving. But he did not have them. Boy, you talk about profound deprivation. I don't know what's your definition of that. That would be Paul's definition. But what was Paul about in the midst of that context with all of this profound deprivation? It was about kingdom advance. Look at verse 11. Only Luke is with me. We've talked about that. Pick up Mark and bring him with you. Notice this. For he is useful for service to me. You talk about kingdom advance. You know what he's talking about? Who he's talking about when he talks about Mark? He's talking about John Mark. Does that ring a bell? Acts chapter 15. Paul and Barnabas split over who? Over John Mark. Because they went out on a missionary tour. John Mark, he bolted. He left them high and dry when they were going to go out again. Barnabas, John Mark's cousin, says, let's take John Mark. Paul says, absolutely not. And there was a fracture. There was a division right there over John Mark. But you know what? When Paul is writing this, there had been 20 years since that happened. And John Mark had proven himself. He had gone out with Barnabas. He he had served Barnabas very well many places. He had served with the Apostle Peter. He had also served with the Apostle Paul. But just to make sure when Timothy picks up John Mark, he says, pick up John Mark for he is useful for me for service. Should he ever remember that bolting from the Apostle Paul? He is left with these final words from Paul, for he is serviceable for ministry unto me. Kingdom advance to make sure that John Mark is fully and finally and totally restored, that there can be no imagination, no doubt whatsoever about his credibility Paul puts his imprimatur on him. He is a trustworthy individual. Paul is not going to suffer for a second John Mark's second thinking about his role of service. Folks, that is kingdom advance right there. And then the ministry of personal sacrifice. Look at verse 12. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus... Now, I know these are a lot of details. What does that mean? How how is that kingdom advance? Well, just this. He asked Tychicus, but you know what Paul's willing to do? Let loose of him. He's got Luke. Luke's staying. He's not going to send Luke anywhere. But here's Tychicus. You know how it's going to be for Tychicus? You go to Ephesus. Why is he going to Ephesus? To relieve Tychicus. Timothy, who is in Ephesus, so Timothy can pick up John Mark, and Timothy and John Mark can come to Paul and begin to serve in Rome, where Paul is not going to be able to serve. You see, my friends, it's all about kingdom advance with the Apostle Paul. Now, a little insight here. Do this, perhaps, if you're interested when you get home. Look at the back in your Bible. Look at the maps, if you care to. Notice how far Ephesus is from Rome. It's going to take four to six months for Tychicus to leave Rome and get to Ephesus. Then four to six months for Timothy to leave Ephesus and get to Rome. 
I mean, you are talking about an arduous journey. Why would the Apostle Paul do that? Why would he insist that Tychicus go all the way to Ephesus? Why would he insist that Timothy leave Ephesus and come to Rome? For the advance of the gospel. That's what the Apostle Paul was all about. He thinks of gospel advance and everybody labors under the same conditions. We are all in on this deal. And here's what you've got to understand about kingdom advance. In the nuances of all these details, it is known as fully as can be known. Listen to it well, my friend. You cannot serve Jesus Christ without that service costing you something. Do you understand? It may cost you a lot. It may cost you your life. Now I say that here and it's probably not even going to get close to that for any one of us. But there are believers in this world today that they are living their last day today. They are going to die today for their testimony of Jesus Christ. That's not our culture, but it is the culture in many places of the world And I'm just telling you this principle. You cannot serve Christ without it costing you something. Service always costs something. Now, let me just say that a proving ground for service, we want to serve the Lord. We want to serve well. We want to do good, significant things. What is the proving ground for service? No, we're out of our text now, making a quick application, okay? We're just going to tie all this together about serving the Lord here. We serve at home. That's the starting place. You want to be an excellent servant of Jesus Christ? Then you start at home. If you're going to get it done, it starts at home or it never does. You can't bypass that. And that means serving your spouse, serving your children. I don't know according to what home means to you. Maybe serving your parents, serving your siblings. But you can't overlook that. You can't overlook them. That's where it starts right there. If you want to be an excellent servant, you've got to first be a journeyman. You've got to get this thing started. And man, I'm telling you, service at home is as easy as it is ever going to get. I mean, let's don't disregard it. Serving family members is service, but uh, it's as easy as it gets. I wish you knew my wife better. I love my wife. You'll love her too when you get to know her. She is the most blessed thing that has happened to me outside of Jesus Christ. And it has been a privilege for us for some years now on Friday that uh, we go out to eat. And uh, as we roll around to Friday and the work hours are over, she'll say, Do you want to go to Panera Bread? You need to know this in the context. I hate Panera Bread. (laughs) I hate the architecture of the building. I hate the colors. I hate the name of the company. I hate the food that they fix. I hate the prices that they charge. There's nothing I like about it. I absolutely despise it. If you ever read, if you ever hear of a Panera bread burning down, just call the police and give them my name. It was probably me. Now, I don't intend to do that, but I'm telling you, I hate it. And she says, do you want to go to Panera bread? And I'm thinking, well, of course not. Why would you ask that? How could you ask that? You're setting me up asking me that question. I'm thinking all of this stuff and I say, okay. Or I say, sure. Well, you're lying. No, I'm not lying. I hate it. But I'm trying to serve my wife. I'm trying to put her desires and her needs before my own. And I say, sure. That sorry place, that sorry food, we're going there again, and we go there again. I mean, you know, that's, it's not going to change. I'm a prisoner of Panera Bread. <laughs> it's a prison institution, and I married the warden. 
It's a life sentence. I'm never getting out. And uh, so that's just, I mean, it, it's Groundhog Day every Friday. And it's for me to hone that edge of service. But I'm going to say something. This is an aside. Maybe it's too important. I don't have time for it, but let me go ahead and do this anyway. When we're talking about the home, men and women, if you are married, you are going to know nothing about service or excellent service unless you learn to serve your spouse. I'm telling you, where there's a problem in marriage, it comes down to this, is a man or a woman who does not know how to defer to his or her spouse. It's only that way every time. Now, I can branch out into far more specifics, but there's the headwaters of the whole problem right there. Self-consumed, self-interested people that are living for themselves instead of their spouse. That's how, and it goes that way on and on and on. Now I'm getting beyond our text. But that's a training ground for service. And Paul was serving the Lord to advance God's kingdom even though he had profound deprivation. With far more speed, let's move on. Second resolve is this. Having experienced harmful opposition, I will rely on God's justice and grace. Harmful opposition. What was Paul's response? Reliance upon God's justice and grace. Listen, friend, you can't beat it. That's, that's the recipe for success right there. Anything else is doomed. It's failure. It's not going to work. When, when there is harmful opposition, the only response is to respond, to reply with God's justice and grace to lean into that to rely upon that not to give yourself for vengeance notice our text notice the harmful opposition look at verse 14 now he's writing to timothy and as he writes to timothy with all the various and sundry details now he lapses into this verse 14 alexander the coppersmith did me much harm Go, oh, I read that, and I say, Paul, give us a couple of sentences about Alexander the coppersmith, the much harm that he did to you. Paul, I want to know about that. Help me to understand that better. Paul didn't go into the details. It would serve no purpose for Paul to elaborate on the much harm that he did to the Apostle Paul. Take that in the context. Unders the Apostle Paul... Much harm? Are you kidding me? I can't imagine what that would mean when Paul says with all the opposition that he ever took upon himself for the glory of Jesus Christ. When he says about this man, he did me much harm. You can take that to the bank. I don't know all that that meant. Maybe it's better that we don't know all that that meant. But take it to heart. Here was an evil, wicked, violent opposer of the truth. And boy, he was opposing the Apostle Paul. And Paul is warning. He is warning Timothy about him. Look at verse 14. He did me much harm. Notice his response. Notice his reliance. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Child of God, are you making sense out of what Paul just wrote? He's saying, forget vengeance. The Lord will repay him. I don't have time to go into the handful of scriptures that remind us that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You can't do that. You are not up for that. Even if you tried, you couldn't do it. God can do it. And God will do it. For us to stay in the lane of service, we just have to rely upon God's justice and God's grace. God will take care of that. He does not need our involvement. We just keep serving and leave the justice to God. He's going to take care of that. 
But notice what else he says. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. Well, you talk about grace. Paul's extending grace to Timothy. Timothy, I don't want you to come here and come into this thing blinded. You better mark him off. He opposed our teaching. That means, Timothy, when you come with the same message that I declare, you are going to find this wicked man opposing you as well. He is giving him grace of a forewarning. But what did Paul say? Timothy, no, I've changed my mind. Stay there in Ephesus. This man might kill you. No, he says, come on, Timothy. But as you get here, be on guard against this man. Why? Because the truth has to go on. Timothy, I know with you, the truth isn't going to change. But the truth is going to be opposed by him. Friend, we can't serve the Lord. We can't serve the Lord well unless we are lying upon God's justice and God's grace as we serve Him. There's nothing other than we can do except to serve Him and rely upon Him to take care of all the details. Leave it to Him. Leave it to the one we are serving. Just serve Him and leave all the details to To Him. That's all He asks of us. And He tells us in no uncertain terms, don't do anything other than this. It is enough that you serve Me and endure what's going to come your way for your service. Don't try to get involved further. Thirdly, and even more quickly, our third resolve, having experienced divine intervention, I will recount to others God's power to save. Ah, look at verse 16. Verse 16. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. What? Divine intervention. It starts with the context of the first defense. Now when Paul is here, it is second Roman imprisonment. In a Roman court proceeding, there were two phases of that. Sort of like our own grand jury, the first phase to determine guilt, if there's going to be a case for a trial to proceed. And the issue was that the Apostle Paul had Romans of official standing. Philippians chapter 4 makes that very clear. He converted many of the praetorian guard that that were chained to the Apostle Paul in his first Roman uh, imprisonment. He converted many of them. They had official Roman standing. They could have been a witness for the Apostle Paul. Then he writes in Philippians chapter 4, Many of Caesar's household greet you. Man, I mean, you're talking about honing in almost on Caesar himself. Caesar's own household, some of them had become born again through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. They all had official standing. Now, here's the beloved apostle in the court proceeding, and not one of them showed up for his defense. Not one. But they, too, deserted him. Verse 16 says, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. Same word that was used for Demas in his desertion, having fallen in love with the things of the world. What was true of Demas in a different sense was also true of them. They just never showed up for his benefit. The response to this, what was Paul's response to that? Chickening out not vouching for him. Look at verse 16 in the end of it. May it not be counted against them. What? They knew the truth. This was their opportunity to vouch for the truth, to vouch for the Apostle Paul. And they are no-shows. And Paul forgives them. May it not be counted against them. Mark that. This is something that could have and should be counted against them. This was wicked. This was a lie. This was not standing for the truth. They failed to support Paul. 
when he needed their support. Paul says, Lord, forgive them. Don't count this against them. But God's faithful intervention, let's hone in on that very quickly. Look at verse 17. Notice this, but, strong contrast, they deserted me. They should have supported me, but they deserted me. Verse 17, but the Lord stood by me. The Lord stood with me. And He strengthened me in order that, notice this, in order that through me the proclamation of the gospel might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. Now what in the world is all that? The Apostle Paul, let me put that to you quickly. No one shows up for his defense. This thing's going to go on then. He cannot be acquitted. There's no one lining up to defend him. So it goes on. You know what the Apostle Paul did? Jesus Christ strengthened him. And strengthened him to proclaim him, to witness about him. And that is exactly what the Apostle Paul did. Look at verse 17 again. Notice, this is what Paul is saying. But the Lord strengthened me in order that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. Stop right there. This was Paul's Super Bowl. I mean, in the happening, it's like there's no witnesses. I'm doomed. It's going to go on. I should be set free. Now, I'm not going to be set free. They've abandoned me. These people have deserted me. But here's Jesus strengthening me. To proclaim Him. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. This was his Super Bowl. Everybody was there to hear about the trial of this great Christian Apostle. Bidding his case before Caesar. The place was packed. And now he stands up with the strength of Christ who did not abandon him. And he witnesses of Jesus Christ. This is his Super Bowl. All the Gentiles, and they were pagans. These Romans, they heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 17, how it ends. And I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. What does that mean in serving the Lord? Do you know what it meant for... The, that's an axiomatic statement. To be in the lion's mouth is certain devastation. Certain destruction. You know what certain destruction was in the thinking of the Apostle Paul? To have an opportunity to speak for Jesus Christ and not do it. They deserted me. Christ strengthened me. Boy, he stood up and he proclaimed Jesus Christ. The proclamation was fully made and all the Gentiles heard and in that he was spared from the lion's mouth. You see this man, what a devoted servant he was to Christ. He proved himself at every turn. And notice what he says. The Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and he will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Well, I left some blanks so I ought to fill them in for you. Our conclusion is simply this. We've seen these three resolves. Friend, how are you resolved? We see what the, what the spiritual Cardi Graham was for the Apostle Paul. He was all about Jesus Christ. About serving everybody else. Never serving himself. These Resolves we need to make. Now there's some things that can help us in these resolves if you're willing to make them. Some very specific practical things. And let me just fill in the blank for you. I can't elaborate on them. Number one, if you're going to serve the Lord, if you're going to make these resolves from here on out, I, man, I'm getting with it. These resolves, true of Paul, true of me. Now, these are going to be some specific helps for me to keep that, those resolves having made them. Number one, accept, accept every circumstance of your life as that which is allowed by God for your maximum productivity. That means look at your life and say it can't be better. This is how God has arranged it at this point at this time. It's for my maximum productivity. You've got to accept that. 
You can't chafe under that. This is how it is. This is designed by God. It can't get better than that. You've got to accept that. Secondly, adapt. Adapt your life for the accomplishment of His will for you. You see, Acts chapter 16, that passage of Scripture... Paul and his co-laborers, they had to adapt. God was leading them a specific way, and they had to flex with that. They had a plan. They had a program. God was overruling that. Friend, that's how we serve Him well. We've got to be adaptable, just as Paul was. Thirdly, adore. Adore Him through the praise of your heart and from the purity of your life. Acts 16, that passage, you understand it's a prison narrative. Here was Paul around midnight, having been beaten with many blows, his feet in the stocks around midnight. What is he found doing? Singing hymns of praise to God. And all the other prisoners heard that. And Jesus Christ was being glorified through that unjust prison experience at that point. Serving the Lord with excellence. Adoring Him regardless of your circumstances. Number four, abandon yourself completely. Abandon yourself completely to what God has brought you to in these days. Acts chapter 9. Paul's going to Damascus to do what? To destroy the church. What happens? Paul is converted What does Paul do after three days when he regains his sight? He goes to the synagogues in Damascus and he is proclaiming Jesus Christ. I mean, the very polar opposite thing. He's not taking prisoners of Christians. He's going to the Jewish synagogues and he's proclaiming Christ there. He was fully abandoned to what God was doing in his life. In those days. Friends, that's how we serve the Lord with true excellence. Just as the Apostle Paul did. Now it cannot be missed that perhaps some of you are not serving Him and you cannot. And the simple reason is simply this. You are not a servant of Jesus Christ. Because you're not a follower of Christ. You do not know Him. He's not your Savior. He's not your Lord. He's not the agenda of your everyday life, and He never will be. It's impossible. And it will remain impossible until you come to Christ. My friend, listen to me. Your sin has damned you, and it's going to doom you for all eternity. Hell is real, and you are going there. Outside of a saving relationship to Jesus Christ, you will be there forever, having stood before Him at the great white throne judgment to be judged according to your sin, and you will be punished accordingly. There's only one hope for you, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh. God, yes, man, Yes, born of a virgin, miracle of miracles, sinless because He was God in human flesh. He was, as John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. God's only outlet of salvation for you is the Lamb of God. Not a Lamb, but the Lamb. He's the only one. He is God's lamb. He has been sent for you to recover you from your sin. He's it. He's your only solution. He went to the cross and on that cross he became sin for you. He took God's wrath for your sin. And on that cross he shed his blood that his holy blood could expunge you from your sin to wash away your sin completely. Did that happen? Yes, It happened. How do we know? He died on that cross. He died the death that you deserve to die under His wrath. But He died and He was raised again because He was the sinless Son of God. 
He was God's only lamb. And he is our only source of salvation. If you turn from your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ, you can be a Christian. You can be a Christ one. You can be born again, forgiven of your sin. And now you can live to serve him. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for whatever insight that you have made available to our own lives and our own hearts. May you be glorified, Lord, in how we respond to your eternal word as we live every day of our life before you from this day to the last day that we live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.